Thank you, Kimberly. Class of 2011. Did I say 2011? All right. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Mark Danner is a writer and reporter who has written on politics and foreign affairs, focusing on war and conflict. He has covered Central America, Haiti, the Balkans, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the rest of the Middle East. Danner is Chancellor's Professor of Journalism and Politics at the University of California, Berkeley, and James Clark Chase Professor of Foreign Affairs, Politics, and Humanities at Bard College. His work has appeared in Harper's Magazine, The New York Times, New Yorker, and New York T Review of Books. He has co-written and helped produce a two-hour-long documentary for ABC News program, Peter Jan's Reporting. Darren's honors include a National Magazine Award, three Overseas Press Awards, and an Emmy. He speaks widely on foreign policy and Americans' role in the world today. Please welcome Dr. Danner. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Cullenberg, and thank you, Chancellor. And congratulations, graduates. Is this the class of 2011? <laughs> Well, today you are commencing, commencing. The question is, commencing what exactly? If you're anything like I was, you have absolutely no idea. I was sitting precisely in this place precisely 30 years ago, almost to the day. The fact is that when I was sitting in those chairs, I couldn't even see. I'd been up on Godly late the night before celebrating. <clears throat> This is a confession, and I awoke after an hour or so of fitful sleep, if you can call it that, to find my eyes so red and swollen that I couldn't put in my contact lenses. I succeeded finally, but I put them in the wrong eyes. That was a problem. To take part in the grand processional, to my seat that morning, I was forced to place my hand on the shoulder of an obliging friend who in truth was not much better off than I was, and to stumble along behind him, tricking, tripping over my regalia all the way to my chair. Once there, squinting and blinking, my eyes watering, I listened to a profound speech by a titan of industry, after whom not coincidentally a quite grand building on my campus is now named, and not a word of that profound speech do I today remember. Not a single word. What I do remember, and vividly, is the mixture of feelings that were bubbling in my heart, a mixture that I have not felt, did not feel before, have not felt since. Excitement? Yeah. Pride? Absolutely. Relief? Certainly. But also, perhaps most vividly, a sense of bewilderment and a kind of vague dancing anxiety. Why? Because like you, and God bless you for it, I was, and I remain today, a humanist. Yeah, I look down the list of departments here today, art and art history, comparative literature, creative writing, dance, <laughs> dance, English, ethnic studies, media and cultural studies, Hispanic studies, interdisciplinary programs and liberal arts, all right. Music, theater, oh yes. You are mis compadres. And God bless you for that. I mean that literally. Standing here before you as a fellow who was successively a philosophy major, a religion major, an English major, and finally, and I think this was mainly because I just ran out of time, a proud graduate in special concentrations. That would be the equivalent of your interdisciplinary programs in liberal studies. Mo written on my diploma are the words modern literatures and aesthetics. Yeah. Which means that by the time I was sitting where you are now, I'd heard many, many times from my parents and friends alike that dreaded question that always comes immediately after you confess to being in my case, a modern literature and aesthetics major. Well, what are you going to do with that? Now, I've forgotten precisely what I used to mutter in surly response to that predictable question, but I understood by then, even if I might not have been able to articulate it, that I was a humanist, and that being a humanist had at least two distinct parts. There was the positive part, 
which is a moral and joyful commitment to engage with the best the culture had produced and to think and to write and to create, to make something beautiful and important. That's the positive part. Together with this, though, comes a negative part, which is a sober but determined refusal to let the broader American culture do what it always wants, what it increasingly insists on doing, define us solely or primarily as economic beings, beings classified by how we make money and how much of it we make. Yeah. Now, for you parents out there, as for my parents, this can be a tough distinction to swallow. I know that. For you, this is a glorious day, a day on which, thanks in good part to your efforts, you see your child climb into that small part of our society, 22 or 23 percent, less than a quarter, that holds a bachelor's degree. It's an extraordinary achievement, not least for those 40 percent of families here who are watching for the first time one of your own graduate from college. To the parents and the families, I salute you all. Enjoy At the same time, I recognize that parents of humanists in particular on this glorious day find themselves sitting on a kind of island. Behind you is that stormy sea that you've just navigated with all the perils of a steadily and in recent years dramatically rising tuition and other costs. Now, having managed to make your way through that, you now see looming in front of you and in front of your proud humanist offspring the even stormier sea of 9% unemployment 17% for young people, of record foreclosures, a devastated economy that finds its parallels nowhere in our history except in the Great Depression of eight decades ago. Now, my humanists, I ask you to ignore for a moment those stormy seas in front of you, to tamp down whatever anxiety you feel, and to recognize that you will indeed find a paying job. And quite possibly, yeah. <laughs> Cheer at that. And quite possibly, and this is part of being a humanist too, in a calling that you can scarcely now imagine. Though many of us persist in believing we can carefully plan out our existence, the truth is that life is full of serendipity and that it is humanists, broadly trained, open-minded, flexible and resourceful, cultivating a deep curiosity about and joy in the world who are best situated to benefit from serendipity's delightful influence. What I want to talk to you about today is your real job, what your underlying mission in life should and must be as humanists, as people who are trained to examine the world carefully, to analyze minutely, to read closely, to look beneath the surface and really see, to see through as well. See through the fog, the obfuscation, the confusion, the double talk, the half-truths, the lies. To see through politics, in a word, to see the truth. That's what your education as humanists should have taught you, and that is the mighty tool you must wield as you commence this day, as humanists and as educated citizens, into the bright, shining world. For in truth, it is a world and a polity that is in a very bad way, in a crisis, to use a word much beloved by and overused by journalists. Behind the fog of lies and obfuscations, behind the circus of carnival barkers and bearded ladies sold to you by cable news as the headlines of the day, you know what I'm talking about. The latest congressman who sexted photographs of his crotch to a constituent, I won't mention his name. Behind all this carnival blather lies an American Republic in very deep trouble, in a moral crisis such as it hasn't faced in half a century. The country that stood for egalitarian growth, for a population where social mobility and growing equality with a norm and the pride and the joy has become increasingly stratified and unequal, coming to resemble in its social structure the oligarchies of Mexico or Brazil with their private aff affluence and public squalor, much more than the open societies of Holland or Canada. And in international affairs, the country that stood for human rights and the rule of law is now identified with torture, with assassination by drone attack, and with preemptive war. This is the country, as you commence your lives this day as citizens, that you inherit, one that you and only you must fix. This may seem a bum deal. I agree it is. When I was sitting where you are now, three decades ago exactly, I could have the 
happy impression that I was inheriting an America still luxuriating in a grand, expansive, liberal era. We still felt ourselves to be in the backwash of the 60s, an era of great controversy and conflict, true, but an era in which Americans, including many young people just like you, had protested an endless foreign war and finally put a stop to it, an era when a corrupt and lying president had been forced from office, an era when, in our hopes, the great society would shelter the poor and rise them up to the middle class, when the middle class would see its fortunes steadily rise, and when Social Security and Medicare both would ensure that every American would have health care and a bearable retirement. It was still possible to believe in 1981 that Americans would live in a society in which no one would go hungry, no one would die for lack of health care. A society where, and this is critical I think, the dramatic divisions between rich and poor would be gradually, gradually narrowed. At the heart of this America was an implied promise. No matter where you started, you would expect to do better than your parents and you could expect your children would do better than you. And this belief was not some idealistic fantasy. This had been the movement of the history of the West and particularly the United States for a century and dramatically so for the previous three decades. The movement, this movement was no accident. It was created by politics, notably by the three great periods of political reform, the periods we know today as the Progressive Era, the New Deal, and the Great Society. Powered by the establishment of Social Security, the minimum wage, progressive taxation, the expansion of union represent representation, the GI Bill, and not least, the growth of proud public institutions like the University of California, the years since World War II had brought not only unprecedented growth and prosperity, but steadily increasing equality, with the gains in the nation's wealth fairly apportioned and in some years slightly favoring the poor. These were the years from 1945 to 1975 of the true American dream. As I sat in your place with my swollen red eyes, squinting and blinking, that era had already come to an end. I didn't know it at the time. A counter-revolution had begun. This counter-revolution was no act of God, but an expression of politics and government policy. It began here in California in 78 with Proposition 13, which destroyed the fiscal foundations of the state. Most notably, California's public schools, which had long been the best in the nation, began their precipitous slide to their current ranking of 46th among the 50 states. And tuition in California's justly famous public universities, of which you are now proud graduates, began to rise and rise and rise, as I don't meet, need to tell you. The counter-revolution took power in Washington in 81 with a series of huge tax cuts overwhelmingly favoring the well-to-do and kept going with even steeper cuts by George W. Bush during the last decade. This has helped put our country in a permanent fiscal crisis. We are told, of course, that the real problem, the real problem we face is government spending. Solution to this problem is to cut more. Cut more of the very programs that delivered prosperity in the first place. We're told that the Great Recession of 2008, the result of a mania of speculation on Wall Street that began with a massive real estate bubble, we see its devastation all around us in foreclosed homes. We're told that that's owed to government spending and not to the reckless deregulation of banking regulations that had originally formed the bedrock of the New Deal. We're told the only solution is to cut more and more, to cut government programs for the poor, to cut Social Security, to cut Medicaid, to cut, indeed, to abolish Medicare, to cut student loans, and finally, predictably, to cut, once again, taxes, which means, of course, to cut taxes on the wealthy. This is the essential message of the notorious Ryan Plan introduced by the new Republican majority in the House of Representatives. Cut Medicare, make it a voucher plan for the private insurance industry, and cut still more taxes on the wealthy. I want to ask you to take a moment, new humanists, my fellow humanists, my new graduates, to look beneath the surface. In 1974, the top 1% richest Americans earned 9% of the income of the country. Today, the top 1% richest Americans earn 24% 
of the income of the country. In 1979, those households earned $337,000 a year after taxes. Today, those households earn $1.2 million a year. These are in constant dollars. That is, the income of the top earners has tripled. As for the top tenth of 1%, their incomes have increased sevenfold, from more than a million dollars a year 30 years ago to more than seven million dollars a year today. Meantime, the tax rates of those top 1% went down by nearly a third. The rates of the top tenth of 1% went down by a half. That is the people who earn seven million a year. During those 30 years, while the top 1% tripled their income, the poorest fifth saw their incomes rise by 11%. 300% on one side, 11 on the other. As for those in the middle, well, if you add in the increased hours they work, including the entry of women into the workforce, their incomes over those 30 years hardly increased at all. They stayed the same. Now, I want to be clear, I have nothing against people doing well in our society, and no objection whatever to people growing rich. Indeed, some of my best friends are rich. And I hope, I hope lots of you, lots of you, get rich as well. Though I realize humanists really aren't about that at all. <laughs> but what is striking about these numbers is that it is clear that the United States, from serving as a beacon of an egalitarian society, has become an exemplar of what might be called trickle-up economics. That is, instead of the benefits of those tax cuts for the wealthy trickling down to the rest of us, as they were supposed to, the wealth has, in fact, been trickling up from the rest of us to the rich. Indeed, according to research in the excellent book, Winner Take All Politics, if growth in America had continued for the last three decades as it had during the three decades before, that is, if we had seen all our incomes improve at about the same rate, then those in the middle fifth of earners, the vaunted middle class, who now make an average of $52,000 a year, would be making about $64,000, $12,000 more. Even more interesting, in this imagined world of equal growth, those in the top 1%, who now make $1.2 million a year, would be making nearly $700,000 a year less. Which is not to say that they, wouldn't have done, they would have done badly. Over those three decades, their incomes would have risen from $335,000 a year to $506,000, half a million dollars a year, a pretty hefty increase. But the income of the richest would not have tripled. And for the 99% of the rest of us, we would have shared in their gains. I apologize to you for quoting all these numbers. I know humanists aren't about that. But I think it is vital that you realize a bit and remember what the society, society you are now entering is like and to understand how different it is from the America I knew as a graduate 30 years ago and how far the country has strayed from its ideal. Though Americans persist in seeing their country as a paragon of equality, of social mobility, the facts are stark and indisputable. We now live in the most unequal society in the West, far more unequal than Canada, not to mention Germany or Northern Europe, and the least socially mobile. The only country close in these categories is the United Kingdom. The cherished idea that it is in America above all that a person can pull herself up by her bootstraps is simply no longer true. Now this may seem a distressing message, but I want to hasten to emphasize one glaring and absolutely vital fact. The world I have described is not a fact of nature, but a product of politics. There is no law of the market being expressed here. These facts about what America has become during the last three decades are the result of policies enacted by our leaders policies that severely cut taxes on the wealthy, that dramatically lowered corporate taxes, that undermined unions and collective bargaining, that made possible the creation of banks that were too big to fail and allowed those banks and their executives to loot the public treasury, to let us rescue them from their own greed and recklessness, that allowed the minimum wage to stagnate and fall behind the rate of inflation 
in effect reducing salaries at the bottom of the ladder, and to let other bedrock social legislation lapse or weaken. Just as it took the policies of far-seeing leaders to craft the world of equal growth and shared prosperity, so it took determined and skilled politicians to undo this world and create the trickle-up economy that we see around us today. If you want a tangible demonstration of this, you need only take a drive around the Inland Empire and look at the hundreds of empty houses, foreclosed on by the very banks that the U.S. Treasury rescued. These banks, having been made flush with trillions of taxpayers' dollars, now prosper under a de facto government guarantee, a guarantee that socialized losses but keeps profits private. Today, Wall Street bonuses have exceeded the levels attained before the crash. None of these executives has gone to jail. Very, very few have even lost their jobs. The great majority are flourishing. On Wall Street, bonuses in the tens and even hundreds of millions of dollars are common. Meanwhile, almost nothing has been done to help the millions of Americans who've lost their homes or whose homes, greatly diminished in value, are now underwater and worth much less than the mortgages they still struggle to pay. The good news is that it, just as government policy made this world of inequality, government policy can unmake it. The bad news is that these are policies you, you, must press and fight to see enacted. For as I stand here today, the political system has proved unequal to the task. Indeed, one could say that for the past three years, in the wake of the greatest economic collapse since 1929, we have witnessed a kind of controlled experiment to answer the following question. Does our government control the financial markets, or do the financial markets control our government? The answer thus far, the answer thus far seems to be that at this point in our history, the financial markets control our government. And the dominant political message that is being broadcast is one of, and there's no other polite word for it, one of lies. We are told that government spending is just too high. We're told public services must be cut. We are told that instead of trying to restore tax rates on the wealthy to where they were under President Clinton, to try to fill this fiscal hole, which is a step that President Obama campaigned on, we are told that only cuts in those public programs that average people rely on can restore us to fiscal health. Government spending, we're told, is the problem. Increased revenues are off the table, as the saying goes, even though poll after poll shows that anywhere from 65 to 80 percent of Americans favor higher taxes on the wealthy. It's important, I think, to see these two policies tax cuts for the wealthy, cuts in public services to pay for them as two sides of the same coin. Years ago, President Reagan described this policy to Senator Moynihan. Big government, Reagan said, is like a free-spending teenager. The only way to stop its free-spending ways, he went on, was to cut off its allowance. That is, first you cut taxes, creating deficits, then you insist on cutting services to bring the budget back into balance. Conservatives call this starving the beast. But of course, it is those at the top of the income scale who enjoy the benefits of those tax cuts and those at the bottom who suffer most from those cuts in government services. It is not too much to say that it comes down to your paying higher tuition in order to pay for someone else's tax cuts, someone much better off than you are. Yeah, I'd clap at that. And so we move as a society from the ideal of social democracy of the New Deal and the great society to the skewed and privileged societies of Latin American oligarchies, private wealth, public squalor. We're not yet there yet, however. This is, alas, the world that you, humanist graduates, are entering, the world in which today you commence to take your place. What can you do about it? Well, I don't expect all of you humanists to become politicians, though it is certainly not out of the question that some of you might. What I hope all of you will become is informed citizens, which is to say citizens in the sense that Thomas Jefferson had in mind. Citizens who focus not on the ranters and the ravers sporting, spouting lies about where the president was born or what politician of the moment is acting like an adolescent pervert, but on the true world of political economy that our rulers have been shaping these past few decades. 
I hope you will hold dear the conviction that politics is not something distant and alien, but something intimate and real, something as near and important as your last tuition check. Whether you know it or not, that check may well be helping to pay for someone else's tax cut. And that tax cut was accomplished through the determined efforts of those who not only cherish a particular view of the republic and how it should function, but who are willing to do whatever it takes to put that view into concrete reality. In many ways, in ways obvious and not so obvious, it is a difficult time to take one's first, public, one's first step into public life, as you are doing today. I do not recall a time that's been more dominated by public mendacity and obfuscation. I do not recall a time when trivial and salacious scandal was more apt to obscure true issues of vital public concern. I do not recall a time when the divergence between the magnitude of the problems and the small-mindedness of the discussion of solutions was so great. As we gather here today, our country is engaged in fighting three wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Libya. Yet the second two are little discussed, and the first, the Iraq War, fought as it was in eliminating weapons of destruction that turned out not to exist, is mostly, and in some embarrassment, ignored. Torture, which Americans employed during the last decade to interrogate hundreds of detainees, has now been prohibited by President Obama, though in truth the President lacks the power to prohibit what is already illegal in international and U.S. law, just as he lacks the power to order it. Those who did order an enhanced interrogation applied to prisoners from the former president and vice president on down, proudly recount their decisions in their memoirs, and go on publicly advocating the use of torture. For his part, President Obama tells us we must look forward, not back. The rest of the world is not quite so obliging. Just as the ideal of the egalitarian America has passed into history, remaining vibrant only in our dreams, so the America that was a leading light in the advocacy of international law that led in the drafting and passage of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Genocide Convention, the Convention Against Torture, and so many others, has passed into history, its reputation deeply tarnished by its actions in the war on terror. Who is there to wipe that tarnish away? Who is there to bring back the America of equal growth and fairness? of social mobility? Who is the, there to restore the America that stood for international human rights? Who is there the, to do what needs to be done to reinvigorate an America of equality, social justice, and fairness? All these are ideals, certainly, ideals that were always aspired to, never achieved. Government programs were wasteful and ineffective. Human rights were trod upon in foreign wars. But the ideals remain and we have traveled far from these in the last few decades, and the years since I sat where you are now. I'm astonished by how far we traveled. My last paper before I graduated, I finished it the night before graduation, along with the celebrations, was a paper about Argentina's dirty war, and it took up the disgusting Argentine torture called El Submarino, the submarine. This is the Argentine name for waterboarding. And I never dreamed, as I wrote that paper, my first effort to write about human rights, that three decades later I would be writing about El Submarino as an approved practice of my own government. I never dreamt it, and yet that is what I've done. I wish my generation had done better. The frightening and exciting truth of the matter, though, is that it is your turn now. You are the humanists, you are the thinkers, you're the young people who have taken it upon yourselves to look, to study, and to see. You're the best among us. Find fulfilling work, follow your curiosity, learn, explore, argue, create. All the while though, and I make you this charge, all the while it is up to you as humanists to be public citizens to ignore the ranting and the half-truths and to look beneath the surface and to make tenaciously and steadily with faith and determination a world that is better, a world that accords at least a bit more closely with our ideals and our hopes of what America can truly be. Given the grim picture I've painted here today, that may well seem to be a bum rap, a bum job, but that is the one that you find yourselves commencing today. 
The grim and happy and simple truth is this. There's no one else to do it. I look at you fellow humanists and all your health and enthusiasm and wisdom and vigor, and I feel a wave of faith and happiness as I confer this wounded America into your hands. This America will be what you make of it. Be ambitious, be strong, be bold, and mighty forces will come to your aid. God bless you in your efforts.